Today we're covering a ton of great GameCube games including Super Mario Sunshine, Metroid Prime, Super Smash Bros. Melee, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, Resident Evil's Remake, but we're going to kick things off with some exclusive trivia from one of the most beloved Cube titles, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. To give Wind Waker a more unique identity in the Zelda series, the developers specifically avoided using Europe as a source of inspiration. Nintendo had already used medieval Europe as inspiration for Ocarina of Time, and by extension for Majora's Mask 2, and they didn't want to seek inspiration from Europe yet again. That was something we were conscious of while making the game. Fantasy usually means Western imagery, which I think is a shame. We were thinking about what it meant to be fantasy in a broader sense, and how there are many legends not just in the West, but in many places around the world. So we aimed for a world where swords and shields don't just equal the West. This statement was made by Nintendo character designer Yoshiki Haruhana in Nintendo Dream issue 82, which we translated into English for the first time. In this issue, Haruhana, along with director Eiji Aonuma, artist Satoru Takazawa, and writer Mitsuhiro Takano, reveal some interesting secrets about Wind Waker's development. Many of you are probably aware that Nintendo often starts development on new Zelda games by first creating Link and then a Moblin. And we've mentioned before that Wind Waker's development started out with models of Link and a Moblin to test out character movement and combat, but this isn't entirely true. The team actually made an earlier test for Wind Waker where the player would assault a character based on Moji Mojikun, a Japanese character who wears a full spandex bodysuit. Satoru Takazawa elaborated, saying, We used Moji Mojikun to run damage tests, and the head programmer had suggested having him wear glasses that fly off when he took damage. The action of the glasses flying off was really something. It made me want to send all kinds of things flying when I hit enemies. Having his glasses fly off was just a test for more visually dynamic attacks, but the experiment carried over to the Moblin test, and when the Moblin's weapon flung away, the devs thought, we want to pick that up. And this is where the idea of Link using enemy weapons came from. We have some more exclusive trivia later in the video, so stick around for that. But for now, how about some trivia for the best-selling GameCube game ever, Super Smash Bros. Melee. Melee built upon its N64 predecessor by cramming in more of everything. More stages, fighters, and generally, more Nintendo. One of the most beloved parts of this GameCube hit was collecting trophies by completing tasks, which all came with a bit of trivia to boot. Plum, a golfer from the N64 edition of Mario Golf, appears in Melee as one of these trophies. And while the supplemental text is of some interest, the most fascinating part of this trophy is incredibly hard to see. For an unknown reason, and we mean truly unknown, whenever Plum's trophy is displayed on screen, a pixel art depiction of a gun is loaded into the system's memory. This gun sprite only loads in this one specific instance, and at no point does it appear to be shown in the game with any actual context. One user over on Twitter, at Chief Neef, performed a bit of sleuth work to get some answers. All we really knew is that it loaded while the model is on screen, so the logical conclusion is that the model itself uses this sprite. It does, but in an incredibly bizarre manner. The gun is simply used as a reflective texture on the character's golf club, though it is so incredibly stretched out of proportion that it's absolutely unrecognizable in-game. While we now know where the weapon is actually used in-game, the truth behind why remains unclear. Where does this sprite come from? Why did the team select it for a reflection texture? Some mysteries seem to lay unanswered, but who knows, perhaps one of you recognizes this gun and knows where it comes from. You may remember that we made a video a while back about the fact that Mario Party predetermines a player's dice roll, meaning that huge parts of the game are more up to chance than skill. But Mario Party 4 specifically goes a step further in what one could deem as unfair mechanics in this regard, particularly when analyzing the game's Doors of Doom minigame. This minigame is, of course, luck-based, but by pulling together the calculations, it's fair to say that it also has some of the most ridiculously low probabilities of getting a high score in a Mario game. The chances of a player getting the highest possible score in this minigame is so slim that it could be deemed as less than one in one billion chance of ever happening. The premise of this game is fairly simple. The player must pick a door. If their guess is correct, they advance into the next room, which is identical to the previous one, while also earning themselves a point. 
if they guess incorrectly, their path will be blocked by Bowser, and the minigame will end. The aim of the game is to get the highest score. With the statistical analysis of these two options, picking the right or wrong door, we can determine that there is a 50% chance of getting one point. Moving into the second room, there is a similar 50% chance of being correct, meaning that there is overall a 25% chance of earning two points. This will repeat indefinitely, with the highest score to ever be legitimately recorded in the game being 15 points. But this is not the theoretical cap on a player's score. Through examination of the game's code, we can see that the best possible score to earn is 30 points in total, at which point Bowser is programmed to always appear behind the selected door, and the minigame forcibly comes to an end. By crunching these numbers, we can see that the chance of getting 30 points is 1 in 1,073,741,824, or as a percentage chance, when starting this minigame, there is a 0.000000001% 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 chance of getting 30 points. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Don't the GameCube was pretty reputable for its variety of party games, platformers, and generally multiplayer-centric titles, but one genre it was certainly lacking in for much of its lifespan was RPGs. There were, of course, a few, but many of them didn't release until the system had been around for some time. This lack of RPG titles was actually the very reason Baton Kaitos, a monolith soft title, was created exclusively for the system. Producer Shinji Noguchi stated that they saw the lack of RPGs on the cube and knew they could offer a true RPG for users while also establishing the game as a top franchise on the system. In some ways, Baton Kaitos may not have become a top franchise, but it certainly gained cult status amongst RPG enthusiasts, enough to warrant a prequel. This prequel has a large volume of regional differences, despite the fact it was released in one less region than most games, and never came to Europe at all. Changes between the US and Japanese versions are evident right off the bat. The game's English name, Baton Kaitos Origins, makes it fairly clear that the game's a prequel, but the Japanese release was called Baton Kaitos 2, Wings of the Beginning and the Heir of the Gods. A very brisk title there. This Japanese release even gives players the option of playing the game as either a male or female protagonist, while the English release skips straight to the name entry screen, forcing the player to be male. Why this was done is unclear, but this removal of choice has some implications when it comes to the game's story. The character of Damon will always have the opposite gender of that which the player has selected, meaning that in the English game, Damon will always be a woman. Speaking of bizarre choices, Super Mario Sunshine actually has a detail that some players may have been witness to, but never actually noticed. In most Mario games, as should be expected, Mario and co. will take fall damage when they go tumbling from large heights. Sunshine is no exception to this, with Mario rarely going unscathed after falling great distances. That is, unless he is without his companion, the Flood. For some reason, when Mario has Flood attached, he will take damage when falling large distances, but when he's going solo, he can fall any distance just fine. Regional differences are always a fun thing to explore, but considering Mario's nationality, it looks like for Sunshine, Italians were given a bit of a raw deal. If Super Mario Sunshine is set to Italian in the game's European release, or the later Super Mario 3D All-Stars version, it's possible to execute a very simple softlock. During the Watermelon Festival, the eighth episode of Gelato Beach, reading the first sign that appears straight ahead will cause the game to open two dialogue boxes as opposed to just one, the second box being an unintended empty box which seems to have been added during translation. Sadly, this second box cannot be closed, meaning that the only escape is to reset. Signs seem to be a strange element of Sunshine, as even in the Japanese game, it's possible to unearth some oddities with them. The texture for signposts in the game's Japanese release make use of English placeholder text which appears to have been taken from a dictionary, though with some portions of the text having been inexplicably removed. The unaltered text reads, This isn't gonna hurt a bit, just a little stick. Ready? One, two, three. There you go, all done. However, this Japanese signpost seems to read, This isn't gonna, just a stick. Ready? One, two, three. There you all do. Instead of this mess of a sentence, the English version simply replaced the texture with a series of swirly symbols. Metroid Prime has similar oddities. As it was developed by the US-based Retro Studios, the game had to be translated from English into Japanese. 
If the player is able to scan the projectiles that are fired by Omega Pirates, a task that isn't as easy as it might seem, the description will be made up of placeholder text which reads, This is an Elite Space Pirate for the first page, while the second page reads, Elite Space Pirate Description 3. This is in both the English version and the later Japanese release, which introduced its own bizarre element with the text, having never been translated into Japanese. The untold stories from a game's development are where we can learn about the human struggle that comes with creating products we all enjoy. Metroid Prime is considered one of the Cube's best titles, but creating the game wasn't exactly a smooth ride. Late last year, Metroid Prime engineer Jack Matthews tweeted out a bizarre story from Prime's development that involved putting a GameCube in a freezer. Shortly after Prime shipped, Nintendo told Retro that a quote, bad batch of Cube CPUs had shipped, and apparently Prime was the only game being impacted, with every animated object freaking out when the game was running on a bad CPU. To find out what was happening, Retro needed to slow down some code because it was running too fast for the botched CPUs to handle. But Nintendo could only supply them with one dev kit with this bad CPU. Retro couldn't detect the CPU, and if they slowed it down too much, the game's frame rate would tank. If they didn't slow it down enough, it would glitch. To properly observe the problem, the kit had to be freezer cold. So they literally put the kit in a freezer. Then they'd run the game for 15 minutes until it warmed up, then start all over. Staff were literally running between the break room freezer and the TV, loading save games as fast as possible to as many places as possible in 15 minutes. Then trying new code, then refreezing. They ultimately realized that the problem was with Prime skinning the part of the animation where the mesh of a model is attached to a rig in a way that lets the model bend and distort. Jack came up with a method of sending the skinning data that was a bit faster than in most other games, as it used the locked cache direct memory access to read in data, but also used the write gather pipeline to write it out rather than have everything go through the locked cache. However, Jack's speedy approach was hitting memory bandwidth limits on the write gather pipeline and stalling these botched CPUs, leading to errors in the animations. It's a bit technical, but basically they realized an optimization they'd made to speed up the game was causing Prime to crash on some botched systems because the part of the system that the optimization relied on was faulty. <laughs> That's game development for you. This next piece is about NASCAR, which a lot of people might find really boring normally, but this trivia is actually pretty interesting, so try to stay awake. In October of 2022, NASCAR driver Ross Chastain performed a daring act that was ludicrously dangerous, but also pretty awesome. He performed what was dubbed a wall ride trick during an official race, in which he slammed his car into the track's outer wall and continued to increase his speed. This meant that, to stay on course, he could simply ensure that he coasted along this wall at top speeds consistently without having to slow down for those pesky turns like a normal racer. This granted him a massive advance in the race's standings, rising from 10th place up to 5th, and thus enter into the next stage of the championship. Now, inspiration for moves like this can come from all sorts of places, but you might not expect something so daring, performed in an official race, to be the first time somebody has actually tried the move in the real world, after having only ever performed it as a child in a video game on the GameCube. Chastain explained that he thought of the move because he played a lot of NASCAR 2005 on the GameCube and often performed the move, but with that said, he wasn't sure if the trick would work in real life. Despite the move having been widely applauded by fans for its creativity, Chastain stated that he'd never perform the move again because he still didn't really know how it worked in real life and that the actual experience of performing it was, quote, not pleasant. Not much of a shocker there. On January 31st, 2023, NASCAR officially announced that the move wouldn't be tolerated on the track due to safety concerns, citing Rule 10.526a, which addresses safety issues on a case-by-case -case basis. Speaking of safety, Nintendo sure seems to have an odd sense of what is and is not safe. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door contains a decent chunk of unused data within its files, but one early graphic can be unearthed which shows what looks like a placeholder for the rock thrown by audience members. It appears that initially this rock would have actually been a brick, with the suggestion being that it was changed due to a brick being a more realistic object than the cartoony rock seen in the final game. Maybe they thought kids would take to the streets bricking each other? Ah, oh, who knows. 
If you thought we were done with giving you hot math facts after the Mario Party 4 piece, guess again. Thousand Year Door has an area known as the Pit of 100 Trials, a challenging gauntlet made up of 100 floors, with 90 being populated by enemies with incremental strength as the player progresses, with every 10th floor providing players with a reward, save for the final floor, which houses the bonus boss, Bone Tail. On rare occasions, however, the player may be faced with an entirely different encounter. Instead of an enemy, there is a chance the game will spawn in a mover instead. Movers are characters which allow the player to skip either two floors at the cost of 10 coins, or five floors at the cost of 30 coins. The chances of these characters appearing is 51 out of 1001, or marginally just over 5%, with the exception of floors 96 through to 100 where they simply cannot appear. Movers make use of a random number generator to determine when they'll spawn in, which is dependent on the player's controller inputs. Because of this fact, there is an infinitesimal chance that the player would be able to, by a matter of complete coincidence, perform the necessary inputs to cause a mover to spawn on almost every floor visited. This would necessitate that 21 movers are spawned in a row, and we can calculate the chances of this happening at random to a player. With 21 chances, each at a 51 in 1001 chance, it would be 51 in 1001 to the 21st power, so approximately, wait for it, 0 0.000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
Same with how the water is expressed. And while we're talking about Sega's exclusive offerings on the Cube, let's take a look at a game that has a surprising amount of interesting tidbits. In Super Monkey Ball's Storm World, which contains expert stages 41 through 50, there's a fairly obscure Easter egg hanging out in plain sight. The statues in the background of this world are actually enemies from Slash Out, a Sega arcade game released in the year 2000 that was the third installment to the Spike Out series. Yeah, we won't blame you if you haven't heard of it. Slash Out's chief designer was Daisuke Sato, who just so happened to be one of the stage designers on Super Monkey Ball. As far as we can tell, all of these enemy statues use the actual models from Slash Out, only with a stone filter over the original textures. Did you know? Despite being longtime rivals with Nintendo, Sega drew inspiration from multiple Nintendo games while developing Sonic Adventure. Sonic Adventure's director Takashi Izuka once told IGN.com that Super Mario 64 was one of his favorite games of all time. But despite Izuka's love for this Nintendo 64 classic, he also saw a significant flaw in the game's design. We recently translated a 2016 Japanese Famitsu interview into English where Izuka states, Super Mario 64 came before us as a 3D action game, but I remember not understanding where I was supposed to go the first time I played it. The old Sonic games were designed so you could get to the goal by just pressing left or right, so with Sonic Adventure, we didn't want it to be the kind of game where you don't know where to go. That thought process was what gave birth to the system that points the camera in the direction you're supposed to go. Mainline 2D Sonic games have always had the player hold one direction to move forward, so if a 3D camera in Sonic Adventure always leaned towards where the player should be going, players could simply hold up to cover ground. This would mimic the progression of 2D Sonic titles and intuitively bring the series gameplay into the third dimension. Having the camera move this way also meant Sonic Team could create complex 3D levels without having to worry about the players getting lost. Izuka would go on to tell Retro Gamer Magazine, After thinking up this camera system, we tried it out on Speed Highway and found it was successful. It's interesting that Nintendo would ultimately integrate a similar camera system in future 3D Super Mario titles after the release of Sonic Adventure. Some might even expect the first true 3D Sonic game to take cues from the first 3D Mario game, but what about that other Nintendo game that inspired Sonic Adventure's development? Just like that of an action RPG, Sonic Team wanted to include locations where the player could talk to NPCs to get information, or acquire new power-ups, or even just explore and become captivated by. They called these places adventure fields. Takashi Izuka explained to Retro Gamer that he wanted to make these adventure fields have places in them that were only accessible after acquiring some sort of new power or ability, and even went on to say, I was probably inspired in some way through the Legend of Zelda series that I loved so much. One aspect of Sonic Adventure that's beloved by most fans is its music, and it's evident that Adventure's lead composer, Jun Sunue, went to great lengths to make sure the music stood the test of time. During an interview in 2017, Sunue stated that he'd actually scrapped eight different main themes for the game before he'd finally come up with the iconic track, Open Your Heart. And it was also the sound and feel of the track that came first, with the lyrics becoming almost totally different over time. But the music and culture behind it had been impacting Sonic Adventure's identity long before Open Your Heart had even been conceived. In the mid-90s, Sonic Team shifted focus and developed a few non-Sonic titles such as Nights into Dreams and Burning Rangers. And as a result of no new mainline Sonic games being released, the team realized Sonic's popularity had dropped. They even felt that the public perception of Sonic had shifted to the point where the character felt safe and ordinary. At the same time, some members of Sonic Team had noticed that games like Space Invaders and Pac-Man were becoming popular again within the counterculture, and were being used prominently in urban fashion and indie music. Sonic Adventure's art director, Kazuyuki Hoshino, told Retro Gamer, It made us jealous, and we wanted Sonic to also become popular with this edge of subculture, or at least have some cool t-shirts being made with Sonic on them. So we all got together to try and find this new graphic style for Sonic. What it boiled down to was a graphic style and pose that was more aware of the fashion trends. The artwork was a good fit for the club music I was really into at the time. When Hoshino says, we all got together to try and find this new graphic style for Sonic, he's referring to a contest that was held within Sega. Sega's early attempts at putting Sonic in a 3D world all used designs similar to his 16-bit appearance. But this caused a problem. Sonic's head would obscure his body and limbs from various angles. It was clear to the team that Sonic's design had to be reworked for Sonic Adventure, and the solution seemed to come from the artwork of Satoshi Akano. 
Okano isn't well known in the industry, but he played a pivotal role in reworking Sonic's design, and sadly his contribution has gone largely ignored. The story goes that Sonic team lead Yuji Naka came across Satoshi Okano's Sonic Jam art, and was so inspired by it that Naka decided to hold a contest among Sega's artists to find a new look for Sonic. Okano took part, but it was Sega artist Yuji Uokawa who would win the contest to create the final Sonic redesigns for Adventure, which were somewhat inspired by graffiti art. However, it seems Okano may have had a bigger hand in Sonic's redesign than you might have guessed. In April 2020, Okano told researcher Sean Aitchison, Before New Sonic, I had drawn an illustration of Sonic, and Yuji Uakawa finished it. Because of that, the initial New Sonic illustrations were a two-person effort. This is something very few Sega employees know about. Okano would go on to create the Japanese cover art for Sonic 3D Blast on the Saturn, and serve as a character designer for Samba de Amigo. However, yet again, Yuji Uakawa would receive sole credit as character designer on Samba de Amigo. Okano says he has no ill will towards Uakawa or anyone else at Sega, and good for him. But we have to point out how it's kind of messed up that a significant contribution to both games has been ignored, and we're happy to shine a light on it. But back to Adventure's development. The team took it upon themselves to make a new Sonic game that fans would feel was worth the wait. They first set out to create Sonic Adventure on the Sega Saturn, as it was Sega's main platform at the time, but the team found the system lacked the power to implement their ideas in 3D. This is when Sonic Team heard rumblings of Sega's next fully 3D console, the Dreamcast. The team even had some requests so they could make Sonic Adventure the way they truly wanted, meaning Sonic Adventure ended up actually influencing the power of the Dreamcast. Takashi Izuka recalled, To create a 3D stage where Sonic could run around at high speed, we needed a lot of internal memory on the hardware. Since the Dreamcast was still in the planning stages, we were able to spec out the design for Sonic and then we were able to put in a request to the hardware team about the required memory we would need in the machine which really helped us execute on the design of the game. We started developing the game when the hardware was only about 30% complete, so we were constantly trying to imagine what the final spec for the machine might be as we were creating the content. But this also meant the pressure was on for Sonic Team. Sonic Adventure would now be a Dreamcast launch title and needed to showcase what the system could do. To give a sense that the new console's graphics were high spec, the team decided they should aim for a realistic style with Sonic Adventure's graphics. And of course, this would carry on to the game's sequel. However, Sonic Adventure 2 had some not so realistic inspirations. Shiro Maikawa returned to write this game's story and has since stated that he was heavily influenced by anime and manga he had been watching and reading since childhood. One example of how manga and anime impacted Sonic Adventure 2 was given by Maikawa during a 2006 Sonic Channel interview. In the game, we're able to see Shadow and Maria looking at Earth from the space colony. This moment was greatly influenced by the sci-fi romance manga and anime, Please Save My Earth. Please Save My Earth focuses on a group of students who realize they all share a collective dream and live out alternate lives within a moon base while dreaming. In both the manga and anime, the characters Sheehan and Mokarin are seen embracing each other beside a window, with the Earth in full view. It's not surprising Maikawa would reference this scene, considering he puts Please Save My Earth in his top three manga of all time. And by some huge coincidence, the actress Yuri Shiratori, who voices Alice in the anime, that's Mokarin's schoolgirl Earthling counterpart and lead of the show, ended up being cast as Maria in the Japanese version of Sonic Adventure 2. Maikawa said it seemed like destiny, but it also seems like he was pushing for Sonic to go into space from the get-go. Early on in the game's production, Maikawa proclaimed in front of all his colleagues, Sonic will go to space this time, because it's become the 21st century already! At first, everyone was shocked at this choice in story direction, but everyone eventually got on board, leading to the space colony section of the game being made. Interestingly, Maikawa is not a fan of Sonic's character in the 16-bit games, and felt that it didn't fit Sonic at all. So when he got the chance to write the story for Sonic Adventure, he set out to create a version of Sonic that he himself would like. But for Sonic Adventure 2, Maikawa ended up writing his favorite character of the entire franchise, Shadow the Hedgehog. Early on in the game's development, it had already been decided that there would be a Black Hedgehog character. But other than being cool like Sonic, his personality had not been yet settled on. That was until late one night on the drive home from work, when Shadow crept into Maikawa's mind. Maikawa was mentally going over the scene where Sonic confronts Shadow for the first time, and Sonic blurts out, I found you, faker! Shadow spoke out in Maikawa's mind for the first time, saying, Faker? I think you're the fake hedgehog around here. Maikawa grew fond of Shadow, and even told Sonic Channel, there are times when I feel a stronger bond with Shadow than my true relatives. I cannot think of others anymore. One of the most fondly remembered aspects of the Sonic Adventure games are the Chow, and there's quite a few interesting facts relating to these little critters too. 
There's an unused line in Sonic Adventure 2's data where a Mochow states, Did you know the doctor's mustache is fake? This voice clip had been used to infer that Dr. Eggman's mustache is fake by some extremely poor fact checkers. <coughs> but this is actually not the case. The Japanese version has a nearly identical piece of unused audio which makes it clear that Omochao is not referring to Eggman but to a Dr. Chow. Another name for the Chow principal who has a suspiciously fake looking mustache. And another unused line has Omochao say, Don't play a TV game over one hour which frankly is advice you can ignore. But what you shouldn't ignore is this curious piece of data that went undiscovered for over two decades. In the root directory of all US copies of the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure, there's some old file upload data in the form of two bin files, Sonic ADV underscore H00.bin and Sonic ADV underscore H04.bin. These files use an earlier structure compared to the final file format, and while they aren't compatible with any version of the final game as is, there is some interesting data within these files. Within one of these files is actually a baby Chow called Buddy. The Chow is about 65% of the way towards evolving and wears a set of rabbit ears. This little guy was submitted by Sega A at concentric.net, which is presumably a Sega employee. Sonic Adventure 2 has 20 unique types of Chow, but only 10 can be obtained normally, including DLC Chow. A lot of these unobtainable Chow are only seen in the Chow races, but can be put into the gardens with cheats. That said, there are two kinds of Chow that go completely unused. These are actually part of a trio along with the Moon Chow, a Dreamcast DLC Chow. While most unused Chow from the original game were removed from Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, even more unused Chow can be found along with all the unique types of eggs that go along with them. There's also another set of eggs linked to Chow, but due to the way these Chow are acquired, the eggs go unused. Just like most eggs in the game, these eggs also have shiny variants. Exclusively within Sonic Adventure 2's original release, a picture can be seen on the walls of the Chow Kindergarten showing a playground. There's even textures within the game that match the picture from the kindergarten. And when these textures are applied to geometry discovered within the PC version, we can get an idea of what this area would have looked like, and the impression that it was once a playable area. It seems there was also a library planned at some point, and based on its file name, it seems like it was also planned to be accessible from the kindergarten. In the library, players could download or create new stories for Chow Adventure 2. While this was never fully implemented, Chow Adventure 2 still had the modular design needed to support multiple stories, and there's 10 unused story files on the disc. Fans have heavily requested for Chow and Chow Gardens to return to the Sonic series, but why exactly did they disappear in the first place? According to a 2004 Takashi Izuka interview with Electronic Gaming Monthly, it's because a Chow Garden would apparently have broken up the action of Sonic games post-adventure. Izuka told EGM, In Sonic Adventure, we created the Chow Garden so that new players would be forced to go out, explore the action sections, and find flickies and things. In Sonic Heroes, even if you're completely new to Sonic, you can play as Team Rose and learn how the game works. The level up items are the new motivating factor in Heroes. Izuka would go on to say that flickies were removed from Heroes so that folks who played Sonic Adventure wouldn't be confused and think there was a Chow Garden hidden somewhere, and also that the Sonic Adventure subseries hadn't ended. Based on this, we might assume that Chow Gardens might return someday, but they never did. Did you know? Many GameCube games have differences between regions, often to censor violence, religious references, and anything perceived as unsavory. These changes even affected the system's best-selling game, Super Smash Bros. Melee. In the German version of Melee, and every subsequent Super Smash Bros. game, Popo's name was changed to Pepe. This is because the word Popo means butt in German. Another GameCube exclusive that was somewhat censored is Pokémon Colosseum. In the international version of the game, Rui, who accompanies the character, had her shirt and skirt lengthened. This was to cover her midriff and make her overall appearance more family-friendly. There were also many regional changes made to F-Zero GX. In the Japanese version of the game, if the player asks Roger Buster during the post-game interview what he'd do with one billion credits of prize money, he'll say that he'd get a nice cold beer. However, if you ask him the same question in the English version of the game, he'll simply say he'd get a nice cold drink. In the Japanese game, the player can also ask Digiboy, Do you believe in God? They respond by saying, Who believes in such delusions? This question was removed entirely in the Western release. Another religious reference was removed from the Western release. In the Japanese version, the player can tell Black Shadow, Your rivals are howling for revenge, and he'll respond by saying, I'll send you straight to hell. 
This question and response were both removed in the West. Another religious reference was removed from Pikmin 2. In the Japanese release of the game, the silencer item is worth 666 pokos. In all other releases, it's worth 670 pokos. Since the number 666 is associated with Satan in Christianity, its price was likely changed in the West to remove this connection. Yet another religious reference was removed from the Japanese version of Batten Kaito's Origins. In the Japanese game, there's a scene where the character Sagi is tied to a cross. In the English release, however, the cross was changed to a slab. This was most likely to remove any religious symbolism or references to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Several GameCube games have also been censored to reduce violence and gore. In early Japanese trailers for the GameCube's Resident Evil remake, hunters can be seen slashing off the player's head, just like in the original PlayStation Resident Evil. However, the hunters' attacks were altered in the final game so that no decapitation took place. Kenneth's death was also changed so his head was still attached to his body when the player finds his body. These changes were likely made due to Japan's Sero Ratings Board and their strict views on decapitation in games. Interestingly, however, these changes were carried over to all regional variations of the game. The Japan-exclusive book, GameCube Biohazard Official Navigation Book, describes another way the Resident Evil remake was changed. Apparently, the staircase camera angles had to be altered due to one of Jill's outfits. Jill's unlockable Resident Evil 3 Nemesis clothes feature a very short skirt, so short that her underwear would have been on show if the PS1 staircase camera angles remained. The color of her underwear was also changed to black. This was so her panties were harder to see in reflections, such as at the water fountain. The GameCube-exclusive Chibi Robo has many regional differences. In the Japanese version, the Free Ranger's weapons look fairly realistic considering the game's art style. Their design was altered in the English version, where they were given noses and their guns were changed to look more toy-like. The GameCube had some interesting hardware for the time, such as its broadband adapter, which allowed for online play. Simply having online wasn't good enough for some developers, however. Battlefield 1942, the first entry in DICE's online-centric Battlefield series, was originally pitched as a GameCube exclusive. This plan fell through when DICE became unsatisfied with Nintendo's lack of a robust strategy for online gaming. Several more games were planned to have online functionality. F-Zero GX and Mario Power Tennis were both planned to feature LAN multiplayer, but this was dropped for both titles. In May 2001, Namco announced they were making six games with online play for the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube, but these games never materialized. Only a handful of games actually took advantage of the GameCube's networking features. Kirby Air Ride, 1080 Avalanche, and Mario Kart Double Dash all featured LAN multiplayer that let players race against each other using multiple GameCubes and TVs. Double Dash in particular allowed multiplayer for 16 players across 8 systems and 8 TVs. There were only 3 games released internationally that had true online multiplayer. Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2, Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 Plus, and Fantasy Star Online Episode 3 Card Revolution. Two Japan-only games also used online. The first, GKO Powerful Pro Yaku 10, was a baseball game with downloadable content. The other game, Homeland, was a unique RPG that let players host their own game servers for 35 other players. While the guests would cooperate to complete quests, the host would play the role of God by spawning items and monsters on the server. By default, the GameCube used traditional composite cables for audio and video output to the TV, but it also came with a digital video port. By using component cables, the system could output higher quality video than with standard cables. The component cables were only available through Nintendo's official store, and were made in small amounts. This was because the GameCube itself didn't contain the necessary hardware to convert the digital signal to the analog signal used for the component cables. This meant the hardware had to be built into the cable itself, making them expensive to produce. The digital output port was only built into early GameCube models. Systems produced after May 2004 with the DOL 101 serial number ditched the digital port. This was because Nintendo's own research found that less than 1% of GameCube owners were using it. In the years following their discontinuation, demand for the component cable surged among players who wanted the best video quality possible. Because of their extremely limited supply, prices for the cables skyrocketed on the second-hand market, going for as much as $250, more than the price of the GameCube itself when it launched. Over the course of its life, more than a dozen different colors and variants of the GameCube were released. 
as well as the default indigo, black, and platinum silver colors. There was also a pearl white color exclusive to Europe and an orange spice GameCube exclusive to Japan. There was even a brown GameCube, though this model was only for game developers. The Starlight Gold Edition, sold exclusively at Toys R Us Japan, is one of the rarest models in existence. Other rare variants include 150 units of a special white GameCube released only in Japan, and a custom MTV Contest GameCube, which only five are known to exist. There was also a Symphonic Green GameCube bundled with Tales of Symphonia released in Japan and France. As part of the Shars customized box set, a red GameCube with a custom faceplate was bundled with a matching controller and Game Boy player, a special game demo disc, and a Gundam action figure. A Hanshin Tigers-themed GameCube was made available in 2003 to commemorate the Japan League Championship victory of the Hanshin Tigers baseball team, their first such win since 1985. There was also a GameCube with a Heineken faceplate, made as a prize for a contest where people bought 10,000 bottles of Heineken beer. A small number of GameCubes with custom faceplates were also given to employees of ATI Technologies to thank them for the work on the GameCube's GPU, codenamed Flipper. In later years, several GameCube games ended up becoming very valuable collector's items due to their rarity. Mint condition copies of Pokémon Box and NCAA College Basketball 2K3 can sell for up to $1,000 or more online. Gotcha Force, a creature-collecting shooter released by Capcom in 2003, originally launched to mediocre reviews and low sales. However, the title eventually gained a cult following and became highly sought after, often going for two to five hundred dollars on the second-hand market. Demand for the game was so high that Capcom actually issued a new printing of the game in Japan in 2012. One of the rarest pieces of GameCube software, albeit one of the most obscure, is the official GameCube service disc. Starting in the days of the original Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo operated a line of hardware repair centers known as Nintendo World Class Service, and the service disc was used by this repair team to test diagnose problems with GameCube hardware. After the service was shut down in 2003, all copies of the disc were recalled by Nintendo, making it an extremely rare find. In addition to its technical uses, the service disc contained quite a bit of strange hidden content. There are several songs in the disc's files that were presumably used for audio testing, including a rendition of the Lon Lon Ranch theme from the Ocarina of Time Rearranged album, a version of the Super Mario Bros. theme from the Super Mario World Jazz album, and a sped-up version of Sitting on the Dock of the Bay by Otis Redding. The Images folder contains a few odd graphics, like a color-inverted picture of Mario, the logo of company Art X, a subsidiary of ATI Technologies, and an image of the word Dolphin surrounded by stars and a poorly drawn smiley face. Because there were plans to include 3D functionality in the GameCube before development costs made the feature impractical to implement, the service disc also contains images meant to test the system's 3D display. While most of the images were of generic in-game models, some of them were screenshots from the game Quake. The system had other unique additions. At Space World 2000, Nintendo announced a version of the GameCube's memory card that would house an SD card. This would potentially allow players to save game data to an SD card, dramatically expanding the amount of information that could be saved. However, this never came to fruition, at least not in its original form. The Japanese version of Animal Crossing released with a very similar device. This unique memory card used SD cards so that players could save screenshots from the game. The device is only compatible with Animal Crossing and Pokemon Channel. We're willing to bet that you're watching this video because, like us, you loved the GameCube and its exclusive lineup of games. What's interesting about some of the GameCube's most recognizable titles is that they were originally planned to release on the Nintendo 64. One GameCube game that was planned to release on the N64 was Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem. The game was announced at E3 in 1999 and was even demoed at the convention. Booths demonstrating the game on N64 hardware were situated around the convention hall, meaning a good portion of the title had already been developed at the time of the announcement. As the GameCube was released during the title's creation, and a number of changes were made to the game, it was decided to transfer what had been developed to the GameCube with a number of improvements. Another example is Rare's Star Fox Adventures, which started its life as an N64 game called Dinosaur Planet, and had nothing to do with the Star Fox series at all. After Nintendo veteran Shigeru Miyamoto noticed similarities between Dinosaur Planet and Star Fox, the decision was made to make the game part of Star Fox. Additionally, according to UK official Nintendo magazine, Tricky was originally planned to be Tricky the Triceratops, one of the bosses from the N64 racing game Diddy Kong Racing. 
After transitioning to the GameCube and the Star Fox universe, it was decided that they should become an original character instead. Resident Evil Zero was also planned to appear on the N64 and during this time. It was even planned for the Resident Evil prequel to have multiple endings based on which character survived the events of the game. Unlike the final game, this means that there would have been points in the game in which either of the protagonists, Rebecca or Billy, could have been killed. Unlike the other two games mentioned, these changes weren't made because of the transition to the new console, but instead because of continuity issues. If Rebecca had died in the prequel, she wouldn't have been alive during the story of Resident Evil 1. Speaking of alternate finales, another alternate ending which actually made its way into the game's final release appeared in Custom Robo for the GameCube. Towards the end of the game, the player is asked whether they want to accompany their team to the Z Syndicate hideout. If they select the response, I'm not going, 20 times, Harry will stop his pleading and the team will depart without them. An alternate ending is then shown where the human race is wiped out at the hands of the game's villain, and Harry chastises the player for letting him and his comrades die because of the player's decision to select the wrong dialogue choice. Some games on the GameCube had differences in their releases for various regions of the world. With the compilation disc The Legend of Zelda Collector's Edition, the Canadian release featured different box art. While the US release featured screenshots of each game included in the compilation, Canada was shown each of the game's logos instead. In Japan, the game also came in a two-disc case, but internationally it was shipped with a standard single-disc case. Many believe that this change was due to the Japanese version's increased instruction manual size. On top of this, the music which plays during the game's selection menu differs between regions too. Japan's game has an original remix of the main Legend of Zelda theme. And the international game has the song from the Master Quest menu instead. Another game with international differences is Mario Party 6. In Japan, the vegetable pulled out of the ground in the minigame Garden Grab is a turnip, while elsewhere in the world it's a carrot. In Europe and Australia, the four minigames based on luck, Same is Lame, Trap Ease Artist, Pitfall and Trick or Tree aren't included in the Endurance Alley mode. This is because the games bring a possibility of unavoidably breaking a win streak based entirely on luck. Another change comes with the European and Australian games Battle Spaces, which instead of featuring an uppercase B, display a lightning bolt similar to the Battle Spaces in Mario Party 2. PAL versions of the game also extended the playtime for the minigame Fruit Talk Tale from 60 seconds to 72 seconds. Another piece of trivia about a Mario minigame comes from Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Despite how it may appear, the Happy Lucky Lottery has nothing to do with luck at all. The chances of winning are actually determined by when the player bought the ticket based on the internal clock of the GameCube. The date of the player's purchase of a ticket is saved into memory, and that ticket will win depending on the number of days that have passed from the day of purchase. The player may receive fourth place if they check the board between 4 to 10 days later, third place between 25 and 35 days, second between 85 and 115 days, and first place between 335 and 395 days later. It's possible, however, to cheat the system by adjusting the console's calendar. By shifting the clock forward, it can greatly increase the odds of winning by selecting a day between the given time frames. However, by pushing the clock back to a date earlier than when the ticket was purchased, Lucky Lottery host Lucky will ask the player whether they had changed the console's clock. Telling the host that they haven't will keep the pressure on to speak the truth, which if they do will see the character fly into a fit of rage and demand that the player pay 500 coins in order to reset the lottery and allow it to be played again. To add to this, buying a replacement ticket will simply reset the purchase date to when the new ticket was obtained, meaning that by playing legitimately, the player will have to wait even longer before the chance of winning each respective prize. This is a really complicated system, and for more information on exactly how the game calculates the player's chances, you should take a look at Strider's comprehensive video in the description down below. Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes, the remake of the legendary PlayStation game, features all new gameplay and cutscenes. One of these cutscenes, however, caused some issues with the overall continuity of the series. When Snake is first introduced to Revolver Ocelot, the character is portrayed as right-handed, demonstrated by a display of flair. After Grey Fox cuts his arm off, he attempts to do this again with his left hand, leading to him fumbling and dropping his gun. 
Although later in the game he manages to shoot the PAL key from Snake's hand without hitting Snake or damaging the key. In the prequel, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, Ocelot is shown to be ambidextrous, displaying equal skill with both his left and right hands. He also uses his gun left-handed throughout Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. While it's possible that he could have trained his left hand by the events of MGS2, MGS3 is set decades before the events of Twin Snakes. Though likely just an oversight by developers Silicon Knights, this continuity error could have come about as Twin Snakes and Snake Eater were in production simultaneously, with both releasing just months apart in 2004. One character who went from using a gun to nothing at all is Vanessa from PN03. It was originally intended for the character to use a gun during gameplay to dispatch adversaries, but due to scheduling conflicts, the developers weren't able to complete the gun animations in time. Because of this, the team opted for the character to shoot energy blasts from her hands instead. Instead. Some characters may be defined by time constraints, but others are defined by more outlandish ideas, such as references to other games. In Sonic Team's title Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg, the four playable characters in the game's multiplayer and story modes are actually based on four of the main cast members from the Sonic the Hedgehog series. Billy Hatcher is based on Sonic the Hedgehog, Chick Poacher is Tails, Bantam Scrambled is Knuckles, and Rolly Roll is based on Amy. Each of these characters uses similar colours to the characters in Sonic, as well as striking similar poses as well. As an example shown with the game's box art, Billy can be seen taking the same stance as Sonic in the artwork for Sonic Adventure 2. Sonic Team might reference their previous creations in character designs, but Nintendo enjoyed adding a small easter egg to 1080 Avalanche which referenced their full-blown retro past. A special snowboard can be unlocked called the Old School Board, which takes the appearance of a classic NES controller. While using the board, the sound effects for bumping into objects and jumping are changed to the sounds used for a small Mario in the original Super Mario Bros. There's actually also a hidden cheat relating to this board. By pausing the game and pressing up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, and then B, and then unpausing the game, the screen will become pixelated. Why you'd want to play the game like that, I don't know, this is a horrible mess. Other references to Mario in the game include an ice sculpture of the Nintendo hero towards the end of the Angel Light Midnight City course, and a Mario sprite from Super Mario All-Stars can be found on the bottom of Ricky Winterbourne's 8-bit Soul Snowboard. The alternate version of this board will replace Mario with Luigi instead. The game was also originally intended to have a different subtitle. Rather than being 1080 Avalanche, the game would have been called 1080 White Storm, similar to Wave Race Blue Storm as shown in an unused placeholder title screen found in the game's data. Wave Race Blue Storm actually has an easter egg that wasn't discovered for 9 years. In the game's audio settings, changing the waveform display to that of vertically rising fog, then pressing up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, and then A, X, Z, and then finally selecting the character Hayoto Hayami on any race, will change the game's narrator to a rather unfriendly voice. You have chosen poorly. And the game's turbo sound effect into a little girl making a meowing noise. By the time of the GameCube's release, it had become clear to developers from every corner of the industry that the name Nintendo was synonymous with the word quality. This was even true for their competition, with one unlikely third party seriously considering joining the tech giant. Speaking to Edge in August 2018, Toshihiro Nagoshi revealed that he once pitched a new Metroid title for the GameCube shortly after the console's release, back when he was still part of Sega subsidiary Amusement Vision. Following the commercial failure of the Dreamcast, Sega bosses implemented a company restructure, shifting focus away from hardware to software. Hitching their wagon to any of Nintendo's household names would net Sega the colossal audience of Nintendo superfans previously inaccessible to them. As far as Nagoshi was concerned, developing for Nintendo was an opportunity to demonstrate to their ex-rivals that Sega still had a lot of talent to offer. Sadly, Nagoshi provided no further details on the pitch itself, leaving only speculation on what Amusement Vision might have brought to the Metroid franchise. Amusement Vision closed its doors in 2004, so any preliminary drafting is likely to have been lost with the studio's closure. The ongoing development of Retro Studios Metroid Prime likely affected the disappointing outcome outcome of Sega's proposal. To say that Prime had the full backing of Nintendo would be an understatement. They brute forced themselves into being the majority holder of Retro Studios by purchasing stock in May 2002, bringing it under the Nintendo umbrella and as a first party developer. The amount of money and time poured into Prime is likely to have priced out all proposals, regardless of who was making the pitch. 
To be fair to Nintendo, putting all their eggs in one basket paid off, with Metroid Prime being a huge critical success and a decent financial success to boot. After that, Nintendo had no room for anyone but Retro Studios regarding big Metroid titles. This trend has continued with the development of Metroid Prime 4. Though Eurogamer claimed it was originally being developed by Bandai Namco Studios Singapore, in January 2019, Nintendo announced series veteran Kensuke Tanabe would once again be working with Retro Studios to rebuild the game from the ground up after they were unhappy with the way the game was progressing. Another GameCube pitch kept out of public knowledge came from industry talent Yasuyuki Honor. Now attached to Monolith, Honor is famed for his work at Square throughout the 90s, where he helped shape the massively popular Xenogears and Chrono Trigger. Hone recently revealed to Twitter followers that Namco and Nintendo had once been in talk for a follow-up to the culturally beloved classic Earthbound, otherwise known as Mother 2 in Japan. With the late Satoru Iwata playing matchmaker, Hone was given the opportunity to pitch his GameCube Earthbound concept to series director Shigesato Itoi back in 2003. It became quickly apparent that Iwata had arranged this meeting of the three men, but neglected to inform Itoi that the pitch would be involved, possibly to avoid him turning it down without first seeing what he had to offer. According to Honor, Itoi seemed largely uninterested in it as a serious project, but responded positively to the direction he'd taken with the game's visual style. Rather than using more traditional hand-drawn 2D sprites, Hone used cloth and felt mock-ups to represent a craft base in-game world reminiscent of a child's school art project, predating games like Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World. The mock-ups demonstrated Honor's commitment to the series' setting of 1980s America, complete with the white picket fence and suburban living, while trying to create something grander than past installments. The pitch's ultimate failure was likely attributed to the development of Mother 3, originally set to release on the Super Famicom before shifting to the Nintendo 64 and then being halted in 2000 with the impending release of the GameCube. The project was later restarted, this time destined for the Game Boy Advance on the same year that Honor made his pitch. Mother 3 eventually released in Japan in 2006, leaving fans outside the country itching for localization to this very day. This glimpse of what might have been with an industry juggernaut such as Yusuyuki Hana at the helm only fanned the flames of their fervor. Another beloved Nintendo franchise with a charming aesthetic is Animal Crossing. On August 7th, 2002, Nintendo held a contest for the original game called the Animal Crossing Official Pioneers Program. In the contest, a limited number of participants would receive an early access copy of Animal Crossing and have access to an online forum where they could interact with Nintendo of America staff members, complete in-game objectives, provide feedback, and participate in online chats. To apply, players would have to submit a short 50-word message explaining why Nintendo should pick them to be Animal Crossing Pioneers Pioneers, with 125 teams of two people ultimately being chosen. Each winner was provided with a specially marked promotional disc for Animal Crossing, a 59-block memory card, a calendar spanning September 2002 to December 2003, as well as online forum access. As the gaming industry matured, the system menus of older generations of consoles have turned into a strangely specific font of nostalgia. For many, the rotating glass cube of the GameCube's menu screen is no different, and over the years fans have been delving into the code for the system's IPL, basically the pre-boot sequence, to strip it back and see how it all works. Hidden in the system's IPL ROM is a block of text that reads, Pokemon Kinjin 2000, the new Pokemon Stadium. This was likely used to test the gameplay side of the cube, which displays the name and logo of the current game loaded into the disk drive. We're guessing that someone at Nintendo must have been very excited about Pokemon Stadium 2 for the Nintendo 64, known as Pokemon Kinjin in Japan and evidently either upcoming or freshly released at the time. What's more, the game was released in December 2000, pinning the IPL ROM's dev date to around a year before the GameCube's release. A far less endearing message shows up in the code of the 2007 GameCube title Meet the Robinsons, left by developers Avalanche Software for any oblivious game preservationist to find. I am a hacksaw because I love <laughs> Avalanche clearly had an ongoing issue with the rising number of homebrew and emulation enthusiasts, and has a storied history of building emulation detection into their software to prevent their games running on anything other than their intended hardware. 
The less than savoury shout out is pretty amusing when you consider the game itself is an adaptation of the Disney film of the same name, and was subsequently published by Disney Interactive Studios. Developer Capcom has found much success on many platforms, GameCube included with its Mega Man franchise. The Personal Terminal, or PET, became a prominent part of the Mega Man universe after the release of Mega Man Battle Network. In these spin-offs, Mega Man is protagonist Lan Hikari's Net Navigator, an artificial intelligence installed on the PET that allows him to traverse the net, fighting off rogue viruses and bringing down online crime organizations. By the time the GameCube rolled around, the PET was as as intrinsic to Mega Man as the Pokeball is to Pokemon, helped by its prominence in the Mega Man NT Warrior anime. Fans had embraced the IP's reimagining, and a follow-up of Battle Network was released exclusively for the GameCube called Mega Man Network Transmission. Nintendo had concept art knocked up for a special edition GameCube controller set to be bundled with every copy of the game. Designed to resemble the plug-in PET shown in the anime, it even includes an empty frame in the place of the PET screen that the player could slide any image they liked to personalize it for themselves. Fans were unaware of the controller until the publication of the art book Mega Man Battle Network Official Complete Works. Originally published in 2009, the art book has been tough to get hold of, but the hardcover release in August 2019 has given Mega Man Mega fans the opportunity to get their hands on a copy relatively cheaply. Another third-party franchise title that GameCube fans welcomed with open arms was Soul Calibur 2. This is partly because the GameCube version of the game featured Link as a playable character, as you likely already know. However, what you may not know is that the remnants of Link can still be found in the PlayStation 2 version's game disc. It's possible to pull up Link's character profile by modding the game to pull up text that isn't normally accessible. This can also be done with Spawn, the playable character exclusive to the Xbox version of the game. With this discovery, it's possible that more remnants of the GameCube version could be on the PS2 game disc. Did you know? There were numerous scrap versions of Resident Evil 4 developed as far back as 1998, seven years before the final game's release. At the request of producer Shinji Mikami, the first version was directed by Hideki Kamiya following his success directing Resident Evil 2. Wanting to do something different, Kamiya tried to defy the series' conventions by ditching the tank controls and fixed camera angles. In its place would be a fast-paced, stylish action game starring a superhuman protagonist originally named Tony. Resident Evil 3 scenario writer Yasuhisa Kawamura recalled, Mikami told Kamiya to do as he wanted, so he did. The game ended up being nothing like a Resident Evil game at all. Mikami was angry about it at first, but we couldn't afford to scrap the project. Thus, the game was reworked as an original title, which would ultimately become Devil May Cry. Afterwards, Mikami tasked artist Hiroshi Shibata with directing the game's next iteration. Kawamura joined Shibata's team, hoping to fix the Resident Evil series, especially in the face of Silent Hill. Kawamura felt the horror portion of Resident Evil was in a rut. He told Eurogamer, Resident Evil's mystery is dependent upon science and forensic fiction, and that challenges humans to understand the concept fully. Silent Hill's notion of horror was based on hallucinations and ghosts. There's no explanation behind these things. This concept on its own would forever be unknown territory, impossible to comprehend and impossible to predict. I told Shibata, if we want to pursue pure horror, we need to find an unexplainable concept. Let's create a setting that doesn't revolve around science or reason. Inspired by the 2000 film Lost Souls, Kawamura came up with the idea of Leon being infected with a mysterious virus and plagued by hallucinations. Players would also be relentlessly pursued by a ghostly man wielding a hook. This iteration of the game, dubbed the Hookman version by some, was introduced by Mikami at E3 2003. However, in spite of Mikami's claims that the project was proceeding very smoothly, the game was in deep trouble. Kawamura didn't want players to know when Leon's hallucination would happen, so hidden checkpoints would trigger Leon's hallucinations. And depending on the player's behavior, the structure of the world would change. This meant the team had to create two sets of 3D models for everything, one for the real world and one for hallucinations. This doubled the development cost and was difficult to fit into the GameCube's RAM. The team tried reworking the project several times over to save it, and considered featuring a single monster throughout the entirety of the game at one point. And despite their efforts, Mikami ultimately stepped in and took over development, creating the Resident Evil 4 we know today. Kawamura confessed, it was disappointing and discouraging. I still think the idea was brilliant, but I didn't have enough skill or guts to put the plan into action. I don't know if I could have done anything to prevent that occurrence. I just wanted to make a scary Resident Evil game. 
Interestingly, references to Shibata and Kawamura's version of Resident Evil 4 can be found in the debug menu of the Resident Evil 4 preview disc. A list of stages can be found in the debug menu which include references to areas from trailers of scrapped versions of the game, such as Taxidermy Room, Doll Room, and Airship Corridor. Despite the project's shortcomings, Kawamura wasn't the only one who felt RE4 needed to overhaul the series. Producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi also noticed that the Resident Evil games were recycling the same ideas to the point that Capcom staff became bored working on them, and would transfer to different projects. Kobayashi approached Mikami to figure out how they could make a game to please old fans as well as make new ones. Following the mild commercial failure of his own Resident Evil remake in 2002, Mikami decided to take the series in a more action-packed direction. Mikami told IGN, with Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, and all the rest of the series before Resident Evil 4, I was always saying to the staff, scaring the player is the number one thing. But for the first time in Resident Evil 4, I told the team that fun gameplay was the most important thing. That all came out of the commercial failure of the Resident Evil remake. One of Mikami's most crucial decisions was to change the game's camera system. Earlier Resident Evil 4 builds had an over-the-shoulder camera for combat, but the idea to use the camera throughout the entire game was inspired by Mikami playing Onimusha 3 Demon Siege. Though he enjoyed the game, he couldn't shake the feeling that it would have been better if the camera was placed behind the character. While the camera system changed, Resi 4 still uses tank controls, contrary to popular belief. For instance, the player can only move forwards or backwards, while right and left only serve to turn the player in that respective direction. In fact, the game switches to a fixed camera perspective during the Ashley segment exclusively in the Japanese version of the game. Although this throwback was cut from the Western releases, various fans such as YouTuber GarySTZ have modded fixed camera angles into the game with surprising success. At one point in development, the team considered adding the ability to strafe, but the feature was dropped after developers felt the addition made the game feel too much like a military shooter rather than a Resident Evil game. Although RE4 originally started out as a PlayStation 2 game, Mikami reportedly became frustrated with the console by late 2000 and began looking towards competing hardware. Catching wind of this, Microsoft quickly set up a meeting with Mikami on Christmas Day in 2000, hoping to woo the director into bringing the famous survival horror series to the Xbox. Although the entire meeting was conducted in Japanese, Xbox's then director of third party relations, Kevin Backus, was kept up to date in person via written notes. This only bought him a front seat ticket to watch the potentially monumental deal go up in flames right before his eyes. While things started out smoothly, Mikami became skeptical of if the game would perform well on Xbox, which hadn't even launched and faced an uphill battle in Japan. Japan. He asked what Xbox had to offer him and his team, telling Xbox Japan, What is your philosophy? Sony says games are entertainment, something larger, fueled by the emotion engine. Nintendo says games are toys, created by the legendary Shigeru Miyamoto, perhaps the greatest game developer of all time. What do you feel? After Microsoft's team failed to come up with an answer, he promptly stood up, bowed, and left. Back as lamented, I almost jumped out the window because we had said repeatedly that we aspire to enable games that could be considered art, much like film. That because of the maturity of the development tools and the APIs and the power of the technology, game developers on Xbox would be able to concentrate on the features that elevated games to being something more than they were otherwise. So the guy who reported to me said, oh that's so great, I wish I had known that. But unfortunately, it was too late. In a desperate bit to save the deal, Bacchus ordered Pat Ahura, the figurehead of Xbox's Japan division at the time, to board the next train to Osaka and smooth things over with Mikami. However, by the time Ahura arrived, Mikami had already met up with Nintendo and agreed to develop Resident Evil 4 for the GameCube. Resi 4 went on to become the headliner for the Capcom 5 deal in 2002, where Capcom agreed to produce five games exclusively for the GameCube. However, Capcom backpedaled on the deal later that year, claiming only Resident Evil 4 would remain an exclusive. When asked if RE4 would ever be ported to the PlayStation 2, Kobayashi responded, Definitely not, definitely not, it's a GameCube exclusive. Mikami even said he would cut his own head off should the game ever be released on any other platform. Nevertheless, just a few months before the game's release on the GameCube, Capcom announced that Resident Evil 4 would be headed to the PlayStation 2 by the end of 2005. In fact, the game would go on to be ported to the Wii, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, iOS, Android, and PC twice over. A port even made its way to the obscure Zeebo console in Brazil. This statement was referenced in Mikami's next game, God Hand, which included a racing dog named Mikami's Head. Resident Evil 4 had struggled with censorship in various parts of the world. For example, it's impossible to blow off the heads of enemies in the Japanese versions of the game. Due to this, Japanese players can never see the game's Ganados walk without their heads. Similarly, while the game's infamous chainsaw death animation is still present, Leon's head does not get torn off in the Japanese release. The death animation of the Plagas were toned down as well. 
These changes were made due to the Japanese Games Ratings Board Sero's list of banned expressions. This list includes restrictions on the expression of mutilation slash body cutting that gives an extremely cruel impression among many others. Meanwhile, the German version of Resident Evil 4 kept the decapitations. However, the assignment Ada and Mercenaries modes were cut entirely. It's speculated that this change was made as the minigames could be interpreted as glorifying senseless violence. Whatever the case, the uncut version of the game was placed on Germany's list of media harmful to young people, commonly known as the Index, where it faced strict regulations. The game remained on the Index for over a decade, forcing Capcom to censor 2014's Resident Evil 4 Ultimate HD edition in Germany as well, until it was finally removed from the list and subsequently restored in 2016. Violence wasn't the only issue with censors either. According to censored gaming, Ashley Graham's breast physics vary between releases. For example, the physics in the Japanese and European GameCube releases are noticeably toned down compared to the North American GameCube version. On the other hand, the PS2 release removed the physics altogether worldwide. Resident Evil 4 has its fair share of easter eggs. The name of the Killer7 handgun is a reference to Suda51's game of the same name, which Mikami co-wrote and produced. The gun also bears a resemblance to Killer7's Katie Smith's AMT Hardballer. Meanwhile, the description on the Broken Butterfly reads, A very powerful .45 Magnum revolver. This will make anyone's day. The last line is likely an homage to Clint Eastwood's famous line in Dirty Harry. Go ahead. Make my day. Another easter egg laid undiscovered for nearly 12 years after the game's release. On January 4th, 2017, YouTuber SR212787 found a 2D image of a person in a green jacket hidden far off in the distance during a segment of the game in Chapter 5-4. Although the discovery made waves through the gaming community, Capcom has remained silent on the matter and the identity of the person remains a mystery to this day. Did you know? In an early Japanese demo of Resident Evil 4, next door to the shotgun house, there's a framed picture of the chainsaw man with his mask off and his back turned. If you walk up and inspect it, the description says, it's the local legend, the chainsaw man. No matter how many times you kill him, he keeps coming back. They say he was actually the richest man in the village. In the release version, collecting chainsaw man's bottle cap in the shooting gallery reveals his real name is Dr. Salvador. So maybe he's the town doctor, and that's how he got so rich. It's not entirely clear though, because little else is known about the mysterious chainsaw man. His photograph could only be seen in the Biohazard 4 trial edition demo, but it got cut from later demos as well as the game's final release. There was an even earlier demo that had an item called Mikami's Watch, named after series creator Shinji Mikami, but the demo's been completely lost to time along with any trace of the timekeeper. You won't find an image of it online, a leaked beta build, or even a mention of Mikami's watch on any fan wikis. Just like Chainsaw Man's photo, it appears to have once been hiding somewhere in the village. In an old German magazine we had translated, the game's producer said, One day, the team made a treasure item called Mikami's watch to commemorate their director and his boundless love for watches. We even used a dummy watch in this year's demo. However, we will probably remove Mikami's watch from the game. We think Mikami probably doesn't want to let anyone touch his watch. We almost gave up hope finding the watch, but after a few months of searching, we finally hit gold. We talked to a private collector who's in possession of another early demo that's never been made public, who shared this image that could only be found in the debug menu. In Japanese, it says a rather expensive, high quality mechanical watch. Despite our best efforts, the collector wasn't willing to share the full demo with us for archiving, so it seems Mikami got his wish after all. No one's ever gonna be able to get their hands on that watch of his. Speaking of early RE4 builds, Leon's voice was pretty hilarious. No. That Mikami's watch story came from German magazine Endzone, who got some exclusive interviews throughout 2004. If you've seen recent videos on this channel, you know we like to dig up long-forgotten magazines from around the world and get them translated, which is where a lot of the info in today's video is going to come from. So let's jump in, starting with an aspect of Resident Evil 4 that often gets overlooked, the game's audio. RE4's chief sound designer was Yoshihiko Wada, a man who takes his job so seriously that he literally named his daughter Cool Sound. According to Wada, the most important sound in the entire game are the gunshots from Leon's first handgun. It is, after all, the first impression the game makes on the player. So he traveled halfway around the world to make sure he got it right. 
Capcom's sound library wouldn't suffice, and it's illegal to just fire off guns in Japan. So he flew to America to get his hands on some real-life firearms. I was even able to actually fire some guns in LA, he told Play Magazine. I think it goes without saying that this experience was very meaningful for me in the sound creation process of this game. In RE4, you'll be firing your handgun over and over throughout the course of the game. And because of that, the sound for firing that gun has to be really cool, really impressive. He also went to great lengths to make Leon's left and right feet emit different sounds. Take note of how in this moment, only his left footsteps on the collapsed wooden fence. Some people may think, is it really necessary to get that detailed? Wada asked, then answered his own question saying, I say yes, of course it is, because everything starts from walking, from footsteps. As for the game's dialogue, most of the enemies speak a Mexican dialect of Spanish. For example, the very first villager swears pretty heavily. We don't want to risk getting demonetized by saying it out loud in English, so here it is with subtitles. ¿Qué carajo estás haciendo aquí? ¡Lárgate, cabrón! And here's a few more quick translations of memorable moments. Un forastero! Un forastero! Avisar a los demás! Te cogí! Te voy a hacer picadillo! Oh, la campana. Es hora de rezar. Tenemos que irnos. In a recent Famitsu interview we translated, lead designer Yoshiaki Hirabayashi laughed about how a few of these Spanish phrases went viral in Japan because fans thought they were hearing Japanese phrases like freaking unbelievable and flimsy breast sauce. It was kind of a big deal in Japan, so Hirabayashi promised they'd be back in the 2023 remake, saying, we understand these kinds of regional jokes are part of the memories all players have of the game, so all those lines from the original will return, plus some new ones made especially for the remake. There were, however, a few lines that got cut from RE4's virtual reality release in 2021. The game was developed by Armature, a Texas studio founded by former Metroid Prime developers. More specifically, some of the game's flirtatious banter got cut. Armature producer Tom Levy said, It's the year 2022, and some of this stuff doesn't age well, and it doesn't fit with the Resident Evil franchise these days. Here's a few examples of lines in the original that got cut from the VR edition. I see that the president's equipped his daughter with ballistics, too. How rude! And I don't believe there's any relevance with my figure and my standing. So, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? <laughs> Sorry. Somehow I knew you'd say that, but it doesn't hurt to ask, you know? I'm Ingrid Hunnigan. I'll be your support on this mission. Loud and clear. Somehow I thought you'd be a little older. Leon, it's been six hours since our last transmission. I was starting to get worried. Don't you mean lonely? And also, the entire post credit scene. I've rescued the subject. We're returning home. You did it, Leon. Thanks. You know you're kind of cute without those glasses. Give me your number when I get back. May I remind you that you're still on duty. Story of my life. There were more than just these examples, but you get the idea. A representative from Facebook who makes the Oculus headset RE4 released on said these updates were made to account for the tastes of modern audiences. The Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes changed up their inventory systems, but RE4's puzzle-style inventory was so beloved by fans, the devs promised it'd return virtually unaltered in the RE4 remake. The original attaché case was so memorable, in fact, that it got converted into its own standalone game in 2022, developed by Brazilian indie studio Fractal Projects. That game is Save Room, a pretty clever play on words. With 40 levels, it's basically just RE4's inventory system, but with some minor twists and puzzle mechanics. We talked to Save Room's designer and programmer, Samuel Ribeiro, who told us when he was a kid, he played RE4 on an old black and white TV, which added to the horror mood. He found that the inventory management was so relaxing and euphoric that when he grew up, he made Save Room as an homage. Apparently, lots of others felt the same way because user reviews are overwhelmingly positive. And Samuel says in its first year, it's already sold close to 100,000 copies. 1998. I'll never forget it. It was the year when those grisly murders occurred in the Arclay Mountains. 
Six years have passed since that horrendous incident. Resident Evil 4 released in 2005, but the events in-game take place in 2004. That was actually kind of a mistake, the result of a development hell that dragged on for almost five years. Capcom wanted it to release and take place at the same time, so programmers were working 12 hours a day, from 9 in the morning till 9 at night. But development still took a lot longer than expected after they built three different versions of RE4 that all ended up getting scrapped. The first version's story was Leon investigating Umbrella's European HQ with a special unit who all get killed, leaving Leon as the sole survivor. The second version had Leon infected with a bizarre disease, seeing hallucinations and pursued by a hook man. And the third version had actual zombies, but the devs thought it just wasn't fun. No more zombies, they said, and threw it in the trash so they can make the fourth and final version, the Resident Evil 4 we know today. The reason it ended up so different from all the previous games, with their fixed camera angles, lack of resources, and emphasis on horror, was because Resident Evil 1's GameCube remake sold far below expectations. Series creator Shinji Mikami was heartbroken. Looking back almost a decade later, he said, The Resident Evil remake is actually one of my favorites of the series, too. But it didn't sell very well. I have kind of a lingering trauma there, much more than people would think, so I decided to work more action into Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4 would have been a more scary, horror-focused game if the remake had sold well. That's when the old Resident Evil died, and a new one rose up and came to life. In all the previous games, he said horror was top priority and fun factor came second, but now they were prioritizing fun over horror. Even that final build got a lot cut out of it, largely due to time constraints. According to Mikami, 40% of the castle ended up getting removed, which amounts to one-sixth of the entire game. Also, producer Kawada said that they wanted to flesh out Luis a bit more as a character, which is something they promised to fix in the 2023 remake. We mentioned a few minutes ago that the game takes place in 2004, even though it released in 2005. So what we want to talk about next is what happened to Leon in 2005. He wasn't in the next game and didn't return until RE6, which took place in 2012. So what was he up to during those eight years? To find out, you would have had to watch a couple CGI movies, Resident Evil, Degeneration, and Damnation. Most fans never saw them or played the mobile game. And unlike the live action films, both these movies are 100% canon and managed by the top guys who made RE4, with Kobayashi saying, After producing Resident Evil 4, I wanted to make a sequel to that story. So I made Degeneration to show what Leon did next. Then I wanted to make another sequel. So then I continued Leon's story with Damnation. Degeneration released between RE4 and 5, and had the same voice actors from the games. It takes place in 2005, and it's actually structured more like a game than a movie, with two separate scenarios starring Leon and Claire. It begins with a zombie outbreak in an airport, with Claire's trapped inside and Leon's the special agent sent to defuse the situation and ultimately acquire the T-virus vaccine. The story, of course, involves a pharmaceutical research facility, and the movies got some tie-ins to series lore and even some Raccoon City flashbacks that fans will enjoy. Honestly, it probably would have worked better as a game than a movie. A zombie-infested airport with the lights out and a bombed-out pharmaceutical lab make for great backdrops, and the movie seems to realize that. That, as it shows us area maps and divides the story into A and B scenarios. The next movie, Resident Evil Damnation, takes place in 2011. Degeneration was an RE4 continuation, as far as the timeline, but it's Damnation that ended up feeling more like the direct sequel. The story is set in Eastern Europe and focuses on Las Plagas. Basically, there's a civil war in the fictional country of Eastern Slav Republic, with both sides using bioorganic weapons to claim victory. While RE4 was mostly set in European villages and castles, Damnation sees the outbreak spilling into the streets of the capital city. So basically, it's like an RE3-style sequel to RE4. Claire's gone and replaced with Ada, who's mostly off on her own in sort of a separate ways scenario. It's been a long time, Leon. What are you doing here? As far as tone, the RE4 cheese is in full force. Where's everyone going? Bingo? keep saying these things make bad pets. This might hurt a little. In fact, it's maybe even more cheesy, like when Ada gets into a slow-motion knife fight with the Eastern Slav president. Then it happens again later with Leon. 
Talking to Japanese outlet Gigazine, Kobayashi said gun enthusiasts who worked at Capcom thought it was kinda dumb how Resident Evil 4 takes place in Europe, but Leon finds a bunch of American guns lying around. So in Damnation, they made weapon procurement more realistic, with Leon only using guns he could believably get his hands on in Eastern Europe. Back to the topic of weapons acquisition, though, the official player's manual for Resident Evil 4 encouraged fans to buy this chainsaw from ResidentEvilController.com. Not only will you need cash, but you'll need guts to buy that weapon. At 50 bucks, they were more expensive than a typical gamepad, but the box boasted it had, quote, superior design for improved game-centric play. That wasn't really true, though. It actually made playing Resident Evil 4 more difficult. It was a terrible controller, but honestly, pretty cool as a collector's item. Every chainsaw had a unique blood splatter on the blade, and the box it came in was modeled after the house in the Chainsaw Man's village. When RE4 got ported to PS2, they made a chainsaw variant for that console as well. If you go looking for these chainsaws on eBay or Amazon, they're gonna cost you an arm and a leg. Ah, I'll buy it at a high price but almost 100,000 were made, so they're not especially rare, and they could still be found pretty close to their original $50 MSRP. What are especially rare, though, are these official Resident Evil 4 GameCubes only released in Europe. Limited edition console and controller decorated with RE4 logos, and only a few thousand were ever made. Collectors would have a hard time getting their hands on one at a reasonable price, especially if it's still sealed. Not enough cash, stranger. All the way back in Resident Evil 1, Capcom originally planned to have child zombies roaming the Spencer Mansion, but Mikami ended up cutting them because it was disturbing, and he thought people wouldn't like blowing kids' heads off. Later games followed suit and only included adult zombies. It's reasonable that the mansion and police station wouldn't have any kids around, but an entire village without children is a little less believable. So for Resident Evil 4, the missing kids were explained in the lore. After beating the final boss, this game's credits are accompanied by woodcuts showing what happened in the village before Leon's arrival. The woodcuts were later expanded into a 13-page story featured in a book called Biohazard Incubate, which released about two years after the game. It's basically Resident Evil 4's prologue. In addition to the missing children, it also fleshes out backstories for the village chief, Sadler's arrival, and the village itself, all presented as journal entries from a villager named Rodrigo. It's Japanese and pretty long, so I'll just read the very beginning and summarize the rest. Rodrigo's first journal entry says, Within this village are hearts that love children's smiles, kind neighbors, and things of antiquity. It's a modest life full of simple pleasures. The village has maintained peace while preserving its customs and culture. It was here where time flows gently, that I was born, and here where I'll return to the earth. I love this village. I hope this beautiful place will last forever, so I decided to paint it from time to time with my brush. I'll write my name in the corner of each painting to tell my grandchildren and their children, who I might never meet, about the beauty of this place. He goes on to say, the men and women toil the fields, and the children help with chores, like milking the cows. Most of the villagers are related by blood, so they're like one big family. One holiday afternoon, Rodrigo has lunch at a friend's house, who's proud of his new job as an excavator at the Salazar Castle. There's a story elders often tell their grandchildren about the first lord of the castle who protected the village and drove out the paganists. As for the current lord of the castle, Ramon Salazar, well, Rodrigo's not so sure about this new guy. Harvest arrives and the whole town pitches in to bring in crops, even the children. Children are the treasure of this village, raised on the backs of the villagers, Rodrigo writes. It's everyone's hope that the children grow up happy and healthy. After the harvest is finished, they hold a festival with everyone singing, dancing, reading poems, and playing guitar. The village chief, Mendez, was conspicuously absent from the celebration, but Rodrigo doesn't think too much of it since the chief is also the village priest, and figures he must have church business to attend to. Rodrigo writes about how their quaint little village has survived into modern times with its people farming the fields, fishing in the creeks, and collecting wild nuts, loading them onto wagons and sharing amongst each other. Then he says the village chief told him to gather the entire village the following Sunday, so he must remember to bring his wife and daughter. At this point, the pages literally get darker, as the story takes a turn for the worse. Next Sunday at the church, Sadler gives a sermon. 
Quoting directly, Rodrigo writes, After speaking with the village chief, I attended Sadler's sermon. Lord Sadler is a distinguished member of Los Illuminados, a group the village chief holds in high regard. He came a long way to visit us villagers, and spent countless hours regaling us with wonderful stories. He taught us that by undergoing a ritual to purify our blood, sinful people like us can save our souls and attain even greater happiness. Then he notes that his friend who works at the castle, who was once so gentle-natured, has started lashing out and becoming aggressive. Perhaps that's the kind of sin they need washed away, Rodrigo ponders, and he's grateful that Sadler's here to protect them. The villagers are told the ritual will connect everyone's hearts and wash away the impure blood. They all line up for their transfusions, except Rodrigo's brother, who's frightened but ultimately gives in. In his next journal entry, Rodrigo says his wife has been coughing up blood. Then, after dinner one night, his daughter starts foaming at the mouth, goes into seizures, then dies. Rodrigo's wife stands there emotionless while he's in complete shock, not wanting to believe what's happening. He runs to his brother's house, who's begun to go insane. Rodrigo writes, In a matter of days, all the children in the village were dead. My precious children were gone. Not one remained. Not a single one. More adults' eyes have turned crazy, and they've lost their minds. I vomited blood this morning. On the last page, Rodrigo says the chief sent him a message. By order of Lord Sadler, any stranger who arrives in this village must be killed. Great Sadler, I heed your command, Rodrigo vows. Nearby, a villager's head falls off. Presumably, Rodrigo succumbed to a similar fate not long after. And this final journal's the last thing he ever wrote. And that's why there aren't any kids in Resident Evil 4. Sadler's blood ritual killed them all. Okay, and now for probably the most important info in this entire video. Have you ever found yourself playing RE and wondered what you're supposed to be eating and drinking? Believe it or not, there is a correct answer, and Shinji Mikami's got you covered. Diet Coke and potato chips, he said. Lightly salted potato chips. Kalbi brand. When you eat the potato chips, you should use chopsticks so your fingers don't get greasy. That's the Resi 4 diet. That's what you're supposed to eat while playing. Straight from the creator. <laughs> Did you know? Early in Metroid Prime's development, Retro Studios experimented with a third-person perspective, as opposed to the first-person viewpoint in the final product. Since they'd already worked with Rare on Jet Force Gemini, a third-person shooter for the Nintendo 64, there was much deliberation over which perspective to go with. However, after producer Shigeru Miyamoto remarked that the third-person viewpoint wasn't as intuitive, they officially made the switch to first-person. Somewhat ironically, this change caused another difficulty to arise. The Morph Ball, one of the series' trademark abilities, was a huge sticking point for the team during development. The team couldn't make the necessary Morph Ball transition between first-person to third-person flow seamlessly. The change needed to be as smooth and natural as it was in Super Metroid, and if this couldn't be achieved, the ability would have to be cut. Yet again, Miyamoto was instrumental, stating that if they couldn't make the Morph Ball work, then the game wouldn't work. The team doubled their efforts and created a system that Miyamoto approved of, allowing work on Prime to continue. Another consequence of this perspective switch was the concept of visors, which became an iconic trait of the trilogy. This was yet another idea proposed by Miyamoto, although the way he suggested it was cryptic. In conversation with the Retro staff, he threw out the question, what would it be like if Samus had a bug's head, much to their confusion? This can be detailed from a conversation between senior producer Brian Walker and senior designer Mike Wicken, stating, At the time, I remember going back to our office and saying, Switching heads? What does that have to do with Metroid? He wasn't asking if she had the head of a fly, he was talking about the mechanic of altered perception as a whole. And so the visor system came to be, allowing Samus to use different visors as a puzzle-solving element throughout her travels. One of the visors that Nintendo viewed as a critical addition to the game was the scan visor, although this particular concept was delivered to the team late in development. To make sure it was complete on time, Retro set one artist and one programmer to the task. However, the Retro staff found it boring at the time, with President and CEO Mike Kelbaugh stating years later, In the US, even now, people hate scanning, but it's popular in Japan. So we tried to make it more collectible, and more informative in terms of describing how to beat enemies, etc. as we went along. The scan visor went on to become a staple in the Prime series, returning in every subsequent installment. 
there are various bits of unused concept art and development documents that run throughout the entire Prime series. Ridley, Samus' reptilian rival, went through multiple portrayals in the design phase. Early in development, he was grotesque, with an exposed ribcage and intestines. A later version was more robotic, utilizing metal components, resulting in a vaguely steampunk-esque design. The joints also resemble the design of the Chozo artifacts found in-game, hinting at what his origin may have been at one stage during development. Like Ridley, Mother Brain also appeared in concept art, although she didn't make the cut. The concept provided a sense of scale in comparison to Samus, revealing a much larger Mother Brain compared to previous iterations. Amongst the other unused art was a large, mysterious flying creature, complete with its own animation, as well as designs hinting at a much more expansive impact crater. It appears that at some point in development, Samus's speed boost and shine spark abilities from Super Metroid were being considered for Metroid Prime. By delving into the buried content in the final version of the game, it's possible to access an image showing Samus jumping and moving at what appears to be quite high speeds. These abilities, of course, were not included in the completed game. Before Metroid Prime 2 began development, there was a tentative title in the works, aptly named Metroid 1.5. The pitch for the game was prepared by Prime 1 level designer Tony Giovannini and concept artist Andrew Jones, and centered around Samus' journey directly following the events of Prime. The plot of this game was centered around a massive starship stuck in a parallel dimension. Upon completing her mission on Talon 4, Samus would enter cryosleep for the journey home. With her ship on autopilot, it would inadvertently latch onto a distress signal sent out by the starship, trapping her inside this derelict vessel. By having the game's setting placed in an alternate dimension, Giovannini and Jones envisioned Samus having to deal with radically different environments. Not only that, but since this title would have followed directly after the events of Metroid Prime, Samus would have access to all her abilities from the start. To balance this, they came up with the idea of a rogue AI controlling the ship, changing areas to limit Samus' capabilities, thus rendering much of her arsenal useless depending on the level. This AI would play host to several personalities as well, each with its own abilities and subsequent gameplay challenges. Their names were The Killer, The Child, The Mother, and The Martyr, with each appearing at different intervals in the game. Their ultimate goal was to crash the ship into a nearby peaceful planet, and it would be up to Samus to bring down this rogue AI. Multiplayer was also a topic of discussion for this title, and was something we would see in the final version of Prime 2, although the ideas they came up with were different from the classic deathmatch featured in that game. One such mode would pit three against one, with the lone player controlling the Omega Pirate, a boss from Prime 1. Several Metroid games have been in development for handheld throughout the years that haven't made it for one reason or another. One such cancelled title was Metroid Dread. First reported to be in development in June 2005 by Game Informer, IGN soon followed suit and confirmed the title's existence in September 2005. With no appearance at E3 2005, speculation arose that it would be shown in 2006. Again, it was a no-show. And with no appearances throughout 2007 as well, there were rumors that the title had been cancelled. However, in 2007's Metroid Prime 3, one of the scandals codex found within the game makes a tongue-in-cheek reference to the project, reading, Experiment Status Report Update. Metroid Project Dread is nearing the final stages of completion. This reignited speculation that the title was in development, though nothing ever came from it. In 2010, after the release of Metroid Other M, producer Yoshio Sakamoto was asked whether or not the project even existed. He refused to deny knowledge of the project, but said there were no plans to release it anytime soon. In the same year, IGN's Craig Harris claimed that he had seen the game while in development, that it was fully written, and that Nintendo could bring it back whenever they wanted. While Metroid Dread is perhaps the more famous cancelled project, at one point there was also the 3DS Metroid in the works at Next Level Games. While only rumor for some time, concept art was leaked in 2014 showing Samus in a slimmer, more angular design. The game was said to play at a greater speed compared to previous 2D installments such as Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion, and would have utilized the 3DS's capabilities by being a 2.5D title. The team at Next Level had a working prototype ready to show Nintendo, but were instead offered to work on what would become Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon instead. This Metroid title was cancelled as a result. There's actually a whole bunch of other interesting changes that were made throughout the Pikmin series. When the Pikmin games were re-released on the Wii as part of the new Play Control line, the Wallywog and Wogpole enemies had their names changed to Wally Hops and Walpoles in Europe. This was most likely done to avoid using a certain word that is a rarely used racial slur in the United Kingdom. This change was also made in the European release of Pikmin 3. The most drastic regional change was made to Pikmin 2. The Japanese version actually featured support for the Game Boy Advance Game Link Cable and e-reader peripherals. By scanning cards on the e-reader, the player could play three different minigames on their Game Boy Advance, Pikmin Plucking, Pikmin Parts, and Pikmin Path. These minigames were removed in the international versions of the game, as the e-reader had already been discontinued in the US and was never officially released in Europe. 
there's a large amount of unused content left behind in the Pikmin games. The first Pikmin game contains data for an enemy called Iwajen that attacks by shooting rocks at the player. The name is a combination of Iwa, the Japanese word for rock, and generator. There's also an entry in Olimar's log for the final day, where he celebrates collecting all the parts for his ship and wonders whether he will ever see the Pikmin again. This is impossible to view normally since collecting the final part of the ship immediately triggers the game's ending. The GameCube disc for Pikmin also contains a Windows.exe file that can be used to run the game in a debugging mode on PC. The game is missing most of its assets, unless the player enables game mode in the debug menu, at which point it can be played somewhat normally. However, Olimar's health will always be set to zero, and there are still some graphical bugs and crashing issues, as well as a complete lack of audio. Pikmin 2 contains several treasures that didn't make it to the final version. Among these unused treasures are four GameCube discs for Super Mario Sunshine, Luigi's Mansion, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, and the original Pikmin. The files for Pikmin 2 also contain images from the Namco arcade game Mappy. It's not known why the images were there, though they were likely just used for testing purposes. There's also data for a seventh type of Pikmin alongside the five normal colors of Pikmin and the Bulbmin. Hacking the game to add the seventh type to your party reveals that they're actually Pick Pick Carrots. The carrots behave like normal Pikmin, though they lack animations and HUD icons. There are several interesting easter eggs and tidbits in the Pikmin games that aren't obvious at first glance. If the player collects all of the treasures in a cave in Pikmin 2, waiting at the results screen for 3 minutes and 50 seconds will cause Totaka's song to play. Aside from the three main entries in the series, there was almost another game that would have featured Pikmin characters. It was an experimental game in development for the GameCube titled Stage Debut. The game would have used the cancelled Game Boy Advance peripheral, the Game Eye, to take pictures of players' faces and paste them onto 3D models. Players could then interact with characters from Pikmin, Mario, and Animal Crossing. A portion of stage debut heavily influenced the creation of Nintendo's Miis and the Mii Channel. Some have also speculated that stage debut influenced the development of Nintendo Land. Did you know? In Animal Crossing New Leaf, at exactly 3.30 a.m. on Sunday and Monday, the regular TV static is interrupted by a message from aliens. Another show can be seen at 6.30 a.m. that shows people exercising. This actually references Japanese culture, and is a nod to Raijo Taiso. The broadcast is essentially an exercise program shown every morning in Japan and aims to keep the nation healthy. New Leaf has several unused concepts. While developing ideas to distinguish New Leaf from previous games, the team considered adding a new tool allowing players to pan for gold. The concept of having the player take on the role of the town's mayor actually wasn't introduced until about a year into development. The team already decided that the game's focus would be allowing a player to customize the entire town, but when they were asked to pitch the game to Nintendo veterans Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka, they realized they needed a better way to summarize their concept. To explain the player's expanded influence over the town, the team made them the mayor. There's an interesting leftover that's hinted at while choosing the location for a public works project. If the player talks to Isabelle about the projects after forcing her into the beach area, she'll advise that the location is too close to the ocean. Normally, Isabelle stops the player before they reach the beach, so this dialogue may suggest that it was once planned to build public works projects on the beach. There's more interesting secrets that can't normally be seen. The computer monitor in the mayor's office is normally out of view due to the fixed camera angle. Unlocking the camera reveals that it actually displays an image of the town's previous mayor, Tortimer. Moving the camera also reveals a small trick by developers present in every main Animal Crossing game. Zooming out or rotating the camera reveals the game's world is generated in a literal cone shape. Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer allows players to fully customize their homes. This was inspired by the team's own experiences making villager homes for this series. Series producer Aya Kyogoku told GamesBeat about the process of designing villager homes, saying, We had to think about, what kind of things would this animal like? What kind of life do they lead? Trying to figure out what they'd want was very fun, and we tried to think of a way we could get this kind of experience to players as well. The team experimented with giving the player a budget for decorating their home, but they felt this limited creativity, and the idea was scrapped. Animal Crossing Wild World contains a particularly problematic type of item hidden in its data. The items, referred to as seeds, take effect when dropped from the player's inventory and spawn landscape features, such as trees, houses, and even villagers. Any changes made with the seeds will become permanent once the player saves. Seeds are used by the game to generate town layouts and can only be accessed by players through the use of cheat devices like Action Replay. While many players made use of seeds to customize their towns, some malicious players used them while visiting other towns over Wi-Fi 
Wi-Fi to render areas inaccessible. At worst, they would spawn so many objects that the host's game would crash as soon as it loaded the title screen, rendering their save data totally unplayable. Wild World's sequel, Animal Crossing City Folk, was intended to include several new features and changes that ultimately didn't make the cut. When discussing how to make an Animal Crossing game for the Wii, the development team wondered if the game's characters should be replaced by Miis. This was done early on as an experiment, but the end result came across as strange and unpleasant, and the idea was dropped. Aya Kyogoku, who would go on to direct, wanted to take advantage of Wii Connect 24 by including a feature where players could visit their friends' towns even if they weren't there. Technical issues made this impossible to achieve in City Folk, but the concept was brought back in New Leaf as the Dream Suite. There are also several special Nintendo-themed items that were meant to be available through the City Folk's point system, but for unknown reasons were never used. They would later be brought back in New Leaf. In the original Animal Crossing, there's an unused squirrel villager that fans have nicknamed Blazel due to looking like a cross between the characters Bliss and Hazel. The only dialogue Blazel is programmed with is one of Captain's lines, and if they're hacked into the game, they'll recite random villager dialogue. For reasons unknown, Blazel is grouped with the game's special non-playable characters in the game's data. Porter, the monkey who works at the train station, is based on a Japanese song called The Monkey Palanquin Carrier. Two other characters with Japanese connections are Gracie and Sahara. In the West, these characters are both female. In Japan, however, they're male, and named Grace and Roland. Isabel, the player's secretary in New Leaf, is named Shizu in Japan, which appears to be a pun on the fact that Isabel is a Shih Tzu breed of dog. K.K. Slider, known as Totakake in Japan, is said to be based on series music composer Kazumi Totaka. Totaka has left a 19-note tune named Totaka's Song in many of the games he's worked on, including Animal Crossing titles. The song appears in every game as K.K. Song, a special tune that K.K. Slider will play upon request. West. Tataka's song is also featured as the background music for the Who's Done It e-reader minigame. In City Folk, if the player waits long enough in Captain's Cab to the city, the song is one of several that Captain will whistle. Similarly, in New Leaf, if the player spends several minutes riding the boat to Tortimer Island, Captain will whistle Tataka's song, though this is only possible if there's a severe amount of lag, making it difficult to encounter. Perhaps the most obscure place where Tataka's song has been hidden is on the official European micro site for New Leaf, where clicking on the picture of K.K. Slider in the background will cause the song to play. The chords and rhythm of the songs performed by K.K. Slider seem to be tailored for a guitar. Though this might seem obvious, it has some complicated implications. MIDI music is usually composed on a keyboard and edited in software, or composed directly into a computer with software. It's highly unlikely that Tataka had custom hardware and software connecting a guitar to his computer. Because of this, it seems that K.K.'s songs were composed on guitar first, or at least composed to mimic how they would sound on guitar. The music even has notes offset slightly before and after each other to mimic the movement of a hand strumming over guitar strings. Another interesting observation is that K.K. Slider has only three fingers, but some of the chords in his songs require four fingers. This means they could be potentially impossible for a three-fingered animal to play. Animal Crossing was originally developed for the Nintendo 64's DD add-on. When the 64DD ultimately proved to be a failure, the project was retooled and released as a standard N64 game titled Dobutsu no Mori, or Animal Forest. However, a few things had to be changed during the transition. The game was intended to make use of the 64DD's internal clock, allowing the game world to change in real time. Because the basic N64 lacked this feature, Animal Forest included a battery-powered clock built into the cartridge itself. Animal Forest was eventually ported to the GameCube as Animal Forest Plus, which was released internationally as Animal Crossing. The game was rolled out in some form or another in most regions between 2001 and 2004. However, it wouldn't see a release in China until 2006, when the original Animal Forest was released for the IQ player. The IQ was a Chinese video game console that could play select N64 games available for download via PC or special kiosks. Only 14 games were ever brought to the system, and the service was discontinued in late 2016. Before Animal Crossing released in the West, the localization team had to change or remove many elements that were too specific to Japanese culture. To to compensate for the cut events, 16 new holidays were added, including Groundhog's Day, Valentine's Day, April Fool's Day, Halloween, and Toy Day, which parallels Christmas. Following the success of Animal Crossing, Nintendo released another enhanced port exclusively in Japan titled Animal Forest E+. This version retained the extra content in Animal Crossing while also adding many new features. Though a number of E+, Plus's features were passed on to future titles in the series, some remained exclusive to E+, Plus for years. For example, E+, Plus expanded on the e-reader functionality and Introduced in Animal Crossing. By scanning the corresponding cards, players could choose which neighbors moved into their town. This feature wouldn't resurface until the release of the Welcome Amiibo update for New Leaf in 2016. 
Players could also hire Tom Nook to build objects, such as street lamps and a water mill to decorate the town. Several of these objects would eventually return as public works projects in New Leaf. E Plus also contains a couple of exclusive hidden features. If the player visits Tom Nook's shop after hours and hits the door with a shovel three times, they'll be greeted by a sleepy Tom Nook dressed in his pajamas. The player will only be allowed to buy the items on display, and everything will be sold at a significantly higher price. Should the player encounter Mr. Rossetti six times in the original Animal Crossing, he'll order them to repeat what he says by typing it out. The player can trigger an Easter egg by instead typing in certain phrases such as dirtbag, butthead, bite me, I hate you, moles suck, and die. Doing so will make Mr. Rossetti even angrier, and you'll tell the player they should be ashamed of themselves. While Mr. Rossetti's tirades are a staple of the franchise, they prove to be too intense for some players. In an Iwata Asks interview, former president of Nintendo Satoru Iwata mentioned, Mr. Rossetti's abrasive tone actually made some young girls cry. When the creator of Animal Crossing, Katsuya Aguchi, started working at Nintendo, he had to move more than 300 miles away from his friends and family. In an interview with Edge magazine, Aguchi said, Animal Crossing Crossing features three themes, family, friendship, and community. But the reason I wanted to investigate them was the result of being so lonely when I arrived in Kyoto. When I moved there, I left my family and friends behind. In doing so, I realized that being close to them, being able to spend time with them, talk to them, play with them, was such a great and important thing, and that was the impetus behind the original Animal Crossing. He also explained that he wanted to design a game he could share with his family, even when they weren't able to play together. This isn't the only part of Animal Crossing that's been influenced by a developer's family life. According to director Hisashi no Gami, Animal Crossing Wild World was particularly popular with the family of fellow Nintendo designer Hideki Kono. Kono's wife spent a great deal of time in the game fishing, much to her son's annoyance. When her son would play the game, the town's villagers commented that she does nothing but go fishing. This interaction served as an inspiration for the We Connect 24 features in Animal Crossing City Folk. With the birth of the Nintendo 64, Nintendo realized one problem with their new foray in the console space third-party support. Many other consoles, particularly those working with disc-based technology, had a plethora of third-party developers helping build the catalog of games available on their systems. Nintendo, on the other hand, working with a more limited cartridge format, struggled to gain widespread support. They developed a new add-on for the Nintendo 64 called the 64DD, which would help improve the system's capabilities. Though this venture proved to be limited in execution, ultimately being released exclusively in Japan, Nintendo didn't stop there. Also looking to help finance more independent studios specifically to release games on Nintendo's platform. Though more than 60 games were announced for the add-on, of the 9 games that did see the release on the 64DD by the end of its production, only one ultimately saw a port for Nintendo's next console, the GameCube but it would not see publication in the United States. That game was Doshin the Giant. Doshin the Giant was developed by Param in partnership with Nintendo, who published the title in 1999 for the Nintendo 64 DD, and 2002 for the GameCube. The initial DD release was exclusive to Japan, of course, as the system never left the country, while the GameCube port was published in both Japan and Europe. The game is presented through spoken narration by a native called Sodoru, from the island Barodo, Sodoru covers his face with a mask and tells a legend of a giant that rose from a sea as the sun rose in the morning and would return to the surf at sunset. While telling this legend, Doshin, the friendly love giant, makes his appearance. The player takes on the role of Doshin, while Sodoru tells the player about the desires of the island's inhabitants, starting with a simple request such as having more trees or having their hills reformed. In return, the people of the island will shower Doshin with love, in the form of hearts, which in turn help increase his size. However, there is a more sinister side to Doshin. He is capable of transforming into a starkly contrasting version of himself, Jashin, the angry hate giant. With each passing day, the giant will return to the sea. The next day, Doshin returns, though this is not the same giant. Each day, a new generation of giant appears at its original size. This isn't to say that each day is starting anew, as each giant will be recorded, and the islanders' relationship with the giants will be inherited by their next incarnation. Sodoru suggests that the giant may be able to help unite the four tribes living across the land. No small feat, and something which will take up the majority of Doshin's time. Ultimately, the game's main goal is to have villagers create monuments towards Doshin, some out of love and some out of hate. Whilst this is the main goal of the game, the player is able to simply spend their time enjoying the island, tending to the villagers for as long as they like. Each in-game day lasts for about 30 minutes, and during that time the player can fulfill requests to bolster their reputation amongst the villagers of the island by improving their quality of life. 
These range from needing more trees, raising or lowering the ground, removing obstructions, or simply wishing for the gift of a flower from the giant. Doshin only has a few skills at his disposal, all based around his monumental size. He is able to manipulate the landscape by raising or lowering the ground, and his size also allows him to pick up objects and transport them, including trees, villages, and even buildings. He is capable of jumping in order to avert certain natural disasters, though because of his size, this will affect the landscape beneath him. When Doshin turns into his evil Jashin form, the ability to pick up objects is replaced with the ability to smash the ground, and to fire a shockwave which can alter the landscape. The button can even be held in to continuously fire. Doshin's size grows after the counter around the perimeter of the screen has been filled with either hearts or skulls, indicating love or hate respectively. If Doshin does something that pleases the villagers, hearts will start to form clockwise around the screen, but if he does something to make them hate him, skulls will appear anti-clockwise. The hearts and skulls are capable of overriding each other, as a full circle of only one type is required to make the giant grow. At times with the giant's growth, issues can also arise. Whilst being larger will allow Doshin to move larger objects or traverse the island quicker, he can also more easily crush villages and buildings under his feet. The villagers rely on a green energy supplied by trees, often required for them to construct new buildings. After some time, however, trees, like all living organisms, will wither away and die. By placing trees near a water source, their life can be prolonged. Placing the wilted old trees together will help them regain their vitality. Giant boxes also appear in a variety of places across Barodo Island, dropping from the sky or found under houses revealed after picking them up. Inside, the player can find a bunch of trees, love or hate, or even new villagers from a random tribe. The boxes can sometimes give clues as to what they contain. There are four tribes of villagers, red, green, yellow and blue, with each starting in a different area of the island, all of which request help in building their village. Each colored tribe builds a different monument for the giant. By bringing villagers of different tribes together in uninhabited locations, they are able to start a new village tribe under a shared banner of their combined colors, which will in turn eventually build a new monument, with 15 of the monuments coming from various color combinations of tribes. In order to start the construction of a monument, villagers will ask for a flower from the giant. Flowers grow in an area where there are seven trees close to each other. Once together, they will wither and die, and eight new trees will begin to grow in their place, as well as a small red flower. Only one flower can be used on the island at a time. If there are two or more, only one will survive. Natural disasters can occur around the island, causing destruction. This includes the appearance of tornadoes, volcanic eruptions, or the appearance of spirits known as naughties, who will appear and steal villages or trees. Doshin is able to counter these disasters, however, reducing their damage. After each day, the player is shown a list of the actions they performed, as well as a number of comments from the villagers, varying in their value positive, negative, or simply just indifferent. The game returns the player to a title screen in which they can review constructed monuments in the monument list, check their photos that have been taken in-game in their photo album, as well as check the stats of the previous day spent on the island in the Book of the Giants. Every new day, Doshin will start at the ornamental hairpin, an object which he is also able to move, changing where the player initially spawns on the island. The core concepts of the game remain the same in both 64DD and GameCube releases of the title. There is actually a sequel to Doshin the Giant, though it could be seen as more of an expansion. Roughly translated as Doshin the Giant Tinkling Toddler Liberation Front Assemble, the sequel is a completely different game that requires the use of the original Doshin the Giant. The game takes place at the Doshin Exhibition 96, where Doshin the Giant has been captured, chained up, and stands center stage. The player takes control of a child who is whisked out of their bed and into the world of dreams, where they find the imprisoned Doshin. The expansion's perspective is 2.5D, with the main character appearing as a flat silhouette of a child, maneuvering around a 3D environment via a side-scrolling motion. The child has a heart meter that is continually filling up, resulting in a game over should it reach capacity. In order to avoid this, the child can tinkle hearts out. Doing so on signs and people will interact with them, and signs representing the variety of monuments found in the initial Doshin release. If tinkled on, the player will need to prove that they have a monument built in their base game by switching discs. If successful, a pavilion will be built in the sign's place in the dream world, as well as a queen companion appearing. This queen companion, will set obscure tasks to complete in the original Doshin the Giant. If accomplished, the player will be rewarded with a movie. There are 17 movies in total to collect, each with the same title, More Than Giant. These movies are black and white scenes based around the original game. 
The player can also tinkle on other kids and challenge them to a tinkle contest, with the opponent joining the player's team if beaten, improving the player's tinkle ability. The aim of the game is to tinkle on Doshin, making him bigger, eventually big enough to escape. The game's creator, Kazutoshi Ida, said that at the start of his career in developing video games, he had set himself a personal rule to create three games, Aquanaut's Holiday, Tale of the Sun, and last but not least, Doshin the Giant. His initial entrance into game development was to create what he called Games Without a Goal, something which would allow the player to not just be entertained, but to take their time observing and learning more about themselves, whilst they learned more about his games. In this sense, Kazutoshi's approach to game development was to create art over interactive entertainment. His focus is on kansatsu, or observation. It is through observation that people allow themselves to think of new ideas and explore more about the world, as well as themselves. Doshin began development as a Nintendo 64 DD exclusive, with the game being released as a launch title for the system, one of only two. In total, only nine games were ever released for the system, with many games considered for development on the console ultimately being cancelled or shifted to new platforms. During an interview with IGN, Ida revealed that he believed it possible to convert Doshin to a cartridge-based title easily, only taking out a few features that would only work on the 64DD. He also revealed that the team behind Doshin was made up of only six members of staff, and that they were continuing to think up new ideas for Doshin on the 64DD, thus leading to the game's expansion pack. While porting Doshin over to the GameCube, some elements of the game were altered. The mechanic of requiring flowers for building monuments was not in the original release, several monuments were altered, the ability for Doshin to slide down hills was added, and the GameCube release includes additional islands after completion, as well as multiple endings whilst the 64DD only had one. Doshin was to be the mascot of the 64DD and Randnet online subscription service that was provided with it. Various items were available to be purchased, including t-shirts, the soundtrack, an art book for Doshin, and Doshin the official guidebook, which was also given away with a subscription. For the short time Randnet was available, subscribers were given a Doshin Christmas card on the second year, and a Doshin newsletter was included with the regular newsletter sent to every member. This however only lasted from December to September 2000. Doshin made his first appearance in the US with the release of Super Smash Bros. Melee, as a trophy shown holding a villager in his hands. Jashin would also appear, though both would be known as the Love Giant and the Hate Giant respectively, rather than their given names. One concept that had been considered by Miyamoto for the title was having the game take place across a truly spherical planet, but after presenting the idea to the team behind Doshin, they had already gone far too deep into development to go back and include such an idea. Ultimately, this concept would be given new life with the creation of Super Mario Galaxy. Within the data of Doshin the Giant is an unused graphic showing the face of a young boy, likely used as an early placeholder. The child's identity is unknown. Allegedly, the strange name of Doshin is actually a slightly modified onomatopoeia of the sound the giant makes when his feet tread on the earth. Param had told IGN in 1999 that the company was in talks with Nintendo of America to bring the original 64DD release to the United States in a cartridge format, as the 64DD was exclusively released in Japan, and thus would need to be converted to work on a standard Nintendo 64 console. Unconfirmed rumors also circulated that Infograms were interested in possibly publishing the game in the US, but this also never came to fruition. Doshin the Giant's lack of GameCube release in the United States is actually related to the release of an entirely different game, one which wouldn't see release in Europe. Cubivore Survival of the Fittest received a release in America, another game which was initially created for the 64DD before transitioning to the GameCube. When asked, Shigeru Miyamoto said that both titles were being reviewed by Nintendo to confirm their suitability for international localization. Atlas announced later that they would take on the publishing task for Cubivore in the US, whilst Nintendo published Ocean in Europe, and both developed by two studios who operated as subsidiary groups of Marigold Management, a company that Nintendo had created to recruit independent game companies. The company, a joint venture between Nintendo and Recruit, a human resources company, was formed after Nintendo found the N64 lacking in third-party support. Marigold would provide the companies with financing, as to let the game studio simply focus on the creation of new titles, with the condition being that the games be ready within five years. The lack of American release for Doshin, but the presence of Cubivore in the region, suggests that Nintendo wasn't keen on publishing an extensive number of niche titles across the world, due to the risk of failure when it comes to returns on investment. Depending on your interest in gaming, 
It's either unfortunate for Europe that there was no release of Cubivore, or unfortunate for America that they would never be able to experience life as a giant just trying to spread a little love or hate.